In the era of combating rapid climate change, we as individuals are now responsible for reducing our carbon footprint and other environmental impacts of our chosen actions in our everyday life. Our diet is a major aspect of it as our global food system is responsible for one-fourth to one-third of all greenhouse gas emissions today. But food isn't optional. We gotta eat. So we need to choose the most nutritious foods that have the least environmental impact. And by now, we all know that meat and dairy are getting the worst press. In particular, we've seen beef getting slashed all over recently because cows are basically burping fart machines. So along with the rising vegan movement around the world, we're told that a plant-based diet is the solution. But is it really the case? Because popular foods like avocados, soy, almonds, and more do cause massive environmental destruction. And let's not forget the mass transportation of those foods across the globe. So this raises the question, how can eating those regional plant foods be less damaging than eating organically and locally produced meat and dairy? Let's find out the answer using data that constructs life cycle assessments, meaning the environmental impact of an item from its production all the way to the shelf, greenhouse gas emissions, land, water and food resources, and transportation. All right, to begin with, before we talk about outliers like avocados, let's look at the environmental impacts of major food items. Speaking of emissions, there's no doubt that beef stands out at the top of the list by a lot, followed by major animal-based foods, and plant proteins generally have the lowest emissions. Of course, we can't conclude that some foods are bad solely based on their emissions. We need to look at nutrition. So this time, when taking protein and energy into the equation, well, it still looks the same. Plus, the methane that's released not by plants except rice, but mostly ruminant animals needs even more attention since it has a global warming potential 84 to 86 times that of CO2 over the course of several decades in the atmosphere before turning into CO2 which still warms the planet. Yes, emissions of animal-based foods vary significantly depending on the farming practice, but generally, most highest impact plant foods emit less than most lowest impact animal foods. And Yes, we'll come back to this later. Now, let's look at land and water use. Again, animal foods are the most land intensive and generally more water intensive to produce. And this makes total sense because, well, when we produce plant foods, we only need the land and water to produce the plant foods. On the other hand, producing animal foods requires raising the animals, which involves producing their feed, which is mostly, you guessed it, plant foods that we are comparing animal foods to. So logically speaking, if we say that plant agriculture culture, especially monocropping is harmful to the environment, we have to ask which diets demands the least or the most amount of it. Now everyone would think grass-fed is better, plus holistic management or regenerative farming is the solution, right? Well, we can all agree that factory farming is the most efficient way to raise livestock. Animals grow bigger much faster using antibiotics and other drugs, meaning natural livestock take more time to grow to the desirable point, which means more burps and farts leading to 20% more methane emissions per cow than grain-fed before sequestration. Yeah, don't worry, I'll get to that. And needless to say, it's obvious that they physically need more space. Organic or grass-fed costs more for a reason. Speaking of regenerative farming, according to this report by the Food Climate Research Network, although carbon can be sequestered into the soil, it offsets only 20 to 60% of annual average emissions. Plus, the soil reaches the state called soil carbon equilibrium, where it loses its capacity to sequester any more carbon in just several decades, so farmers will constantly need new land in the long run. This comprehensive review criticizes the scientific studies in support of Alan Savory, the promoter of holistic management for being scanty. Such evidence as exists is generally anecdotal, based on surveys and testimonies rather than on-site measurements. Even in cases where studies find advantages, they are inconclusive. So the truth is, even arguably the most effective land management is not scientifically proven to be sustainable, but rather regarded as misleading. Plus, in the US for example, even though 99% of meat is efficiently produced in factory farms, based on USDA's data, we are already producing more plants to feed animals than humans, and dedicating much more land for pasture and range. That is, 41% of the country's entire land mass only for livestock, and only 4% for humans. So, it is realistically impossible 
impossible for all of us to switch to domestic grass-fed or regenerative meat as we don't have such land and total beef supply would drop and the price will skyrocket and each meat eater will just be obligated to eat much less meat. When the most sustainable system of farming only in terms of feasibly feeding the population is not working, there's no sustainable farming for everyone and for the planet. Speaking of individual choice, grass-fed is even worse for the environment and climate. So what's the point? You'd simply add more carbon footprint to the food that's already the worst. But don't ruminants efficiently use much of the Earth's marginal lands and turn them into highly nutrient-dense foods? Well, despite taking 77% of all agricultural land, meat and dairy only supply 18% of our calories and 37% of our protein. The rest are from plant sources. So according to the most comprehensive study conducted on this issue, if we all ate the plants we grow directly, much of the excess land that had been used for livestock, which would be over 75% of the current global agricultural land, could be rather restored back to its natural state with more forests enabling photosynthesis and evapotranspiration, therefore dramatically mitigating global warming by cutting the food-related emissions by half or by as much as 4 to 5 times that of managed grazing and increasing our carbon capture potential from other sources. If we went vegan by 2050, we would sequester 547 billion tons of CO2, which is equivalent to 15 years of emissions from our current fossil fuel use, or 8 billion tons every year. And according to this report, if needed, using some of those lands, the US alone would be able to feed an additional 350 million people, or another US on plant-based diets. So much of our land not being suitable for plant agriculture isn't even a problem, and it doesn't mean we should place hundreds of millions of methane emitting animals there to produce foods that we don't even need. Now, one of the most common counter arguments is that 86% of livestock feed is human inedible parts of plants, like nutshells and crop residue, aka waste products from human consumption, so it actually reduces waste. Therefore, livestock efficiently coexist within our dietary ecosystem. First, the assumption that all 86% is waste products is incorrect as it only includes it. Yes, they are fed what we grow but cannot eat, but in order for this argument to work, all the animal feed would have to be gathered here, not here. Let's not ignore the fact that we are still growing much whole plant foods exclusively for them, both in the US and worldwide. Therefore, it's still taking up the land, and it's obvious that we cannot eat most of everything on the cropland, so the percentage of human inedible feed is irrelevant when the cropland isn't even meant for human consumption in the first place. So the coexistence doesn't show the full picture, and it's far from being efficient or necessary. Now, let's talk about what everyone likes to talk about. Buying local is the most responsible and effective solution. Surely nothing can be more destructive than shipping of avocados for vegans across the planet, right? Well, you're about to be shocked at what I'm about to say. If we look at the life cycle assessment, one kilogram of Mexican avocados shipped all the way to the UK produces 2.1 kilogram of CO2 equivalent, whereas one kilogram of locally produced ruminant meat or milk product transported from a local farm to a local butcher to your local store produces staggering 20 kilograms of CO2 equivalent at least. What? How can this be true? The reason for this is not only that freight shipping is incredibly efficient compared to road transportation, but also that transport accounts for less than 10% for most foods. And when it comes to beef, it can be as low as 0.5% of its total emissions. For the controversial avocados, it is 8%, which is significantly higher than that of beef. Are things not adding up? Well, to sum it up, the problem with food-related greenhouse gas emissions is the production of food itself. Here, the pink represents transport, and if I'm right, you had to look for the pink. Yes, buying local is best if you can, but this can be delusive since replacing red meat and dairy with plant-based foods just one day per week can achieve the same result as eating a diet with zero food miles, which is practically impossible to achieve even if you shopped completely local. Therefore, what matters is not where, but what? Plus, we know that Amazon deforestation is largely driven by cattle ranching, 80% to be exact according to Yale's Global Forest Atlas, and more by the massive expansion of soy farming, and 75% of the soy is used to feed livestock around the globe, and only around 6% for all humans. So if you live in the US, there is a good chance you're eating Amazon deforestation and slavery beef. And according to new scientists, in Europe and UK, you're most likely eating that and locally farmed animals 
raised with Brazilian soy contaminated with deforestation. Plus, it is important to note that the standard fishing practice of bottom trolling alone releases as much emissions as the entire aviation industry. And after all, animal agriculture's total emissions are slightly greater than the combined exhaust from the entire transportation sector altogether. We love to call out vegans for eating tons of avocado toast. A medium-sized avocado has a carbon footprint of about 420 grams, which is a lot, but it's smaller than a cup of coffee with milk that everyone loves, and their water footprints are about equal. So my question is, how many avocados does an average vegan eat for every cup of coffee you drink? Let's do some math. 44% of average American coffee drinkers drink 2-3 to three cups of coffee per day. Then a vegan has to eat 3.3 .3 avocados per day to compete with the carbon footprint of 2.5 cups of regular latte. Now, if they eat a 3 ounce steak once a week, the vegan now has to eat 4 a day or at least 30 of the fruit that they're blamed for consuming a week. Keep in mind, I'm being very conservative with this calculation as I entirely excluded the methane and it's not even the most impactful beef. So the highest estimate could be as many as 42 avocados per week. Avocados cannot be our main concern nor an argument against the plant-based diet specifically, considering they are not required for us to be healthy. It's not a vegan issue, it's an avocado issue. But why address avocados before beef? Yes, there's no doubt that avocados are environmentally damaging, but it does not make any sense to justify regularly consuming foods, meat and dairy that are much more damaging than that instead. If you want to make the most responsible choice possible, it should be more natural for you to try to eat a locally sourced plant-based diet without avocados. You might want to reduce your coffee consumption as well. Nuts in general are highly water intensive. In fact, they take more blue water than any animal-based food. So this is something that needs to be addressed. Maybe we should reduce our nut consumption. But it's worth asking, what would happen if we replaced our consumption of dairy with almonds for our calcium intake? Because almond milk contains more calcium and many other vitamins by volume. First, 80% of the world's almonds are produced in California, whereas the state produces less than a fifth of all US milk. But still, if we look at the water use in the state, the feed that's fed to dairy cows takes significantly more blue water to produce than almonds in the first place. The study which the earlier chart comes from says, replacing all meat by an equivalent amount of crop products such as pulses and nuts will result in a 30% reduction of the food-related water footprint of the average American citizen. So, yes, even though almonds are highly regional and water intensive, we could produce and get more calcium using less water and land, emitting less greenhouse gases, and causing less eutrophication by choosing almonds over dairy. In fact, many nut producers are even carbon negative and land use change negative. And if you don't need as much calcium, you can save even more water by choosing oat or soy milk latte over almond milk latte. Either way, dairy, which is outstandingly the worst in every category, Category shouldn't be an option. Even if we magically stopped global warming, we wouldn't be able to protect humanity and the planet. Without combating world hunger and human rights crisis, public health issues including zoonotic diseases and antibiotic resistance, air and water pollution, habitat destruction, species extinction, and other environmental threats that are induced by our modern global food system. The point of this video is not to say that current plant agriculture is ideal. It is nowhere near it. Massive amounts of fertilizers and chemicals used are a problem to tackle. Highly processed foods are an issue in most forms of modern diets, and our food system requires substantial policy changes and improvement. Vegan or non-vegan, we cannot entirely eliminate our impacts on the planet and other living beings. So the takeaway is that it is always important to look at the full picture and that there is always a better choice. Although veganism, either as an ethical philosophy or lifestyle in a holistic sense, is never enough to save the world. As of now, it seems to be one of the most logical solutions.